Hi, good afternoon everyone. I am RxL Dicantila and I will be presenting today the topic of quantitative research design. In this topic, we will be concentrating on quantitative research. Actually, this topic is quite lengthy. However, I only highlighted the important things that we should know about quantitative research. Now, let us first define quantitative research design. Quantitative research is a systematic investigation of phenomena by gathering quantifiable data and performing statistical, mathematical, or computational techniques. Quantitative research collects information from existing and potential customers using sampling methods and sending out online surveys, online polls, and questionnaires, for example the results of which can be depicted in the form of numerical. After careful understanding of these numbers to predict the future of a product or service and make changes accordingly. There are many types of quantitative researches. However, I will only be discussing the most used research methods. Types of quantitative research designs. We have experimental, correlational, and survey research design. Let's start with the experimental research. Experimental research is one of the most powerful research methodologies that researchers can use. Of the many types of research that might be used, the experiment is the best way to establish cause and effect relationships among variables. Yet, Experiments are not always easy to conduct. In this chapter, we will show you both the power of and the problems involved in conducting experiments. Our research objective for this topic are the following. Now, let us learn the purpose of experimental research. Experimental research, also called experimentation, is research conducted using a scientific approach using two or more variables. The first, the first variable is a constant that you can manipulate to see the differences caused in the second or other variables. Most studies under quantitative research methods are experimental in nature. Experimental research helps you in gathering the necessary data for you to make better decisions about your proposed hypothesis. The success of experimental research usually confirms that the changes observed in the variable under study is solely based on the manipulation of the independent variable. In experimental research, we will be encountering words, random assignment, and random selection. What is the difference between the two? Random selection or random sampling is a way of selecting members of a population for your study's sample. In contrast, random assignment is a way of sorting the sample into control and experimental groups. In short, from the population, we select samples. Afterwards, we assign the selected samples into control and treatment groups. Okay, one of the essential characteristics of all experiments is that the researcher can manipulate the independent variables in his or her study. It means that the researcher deliberately and directly determines what forms the independent variable will take and then which group will get which form. To understand, for example, if the independent variable in a study is the amount of enthusiasm an, instruction, an instructor displays, a researcher might think 
two teachers to display different amounts of enthusiasm as they teach their classes. The independent variable in an experimental study may be established in several ways. Either, number one, one form of the variable versus another. Second, the presence versus absence of a particular form. Or, third, varying degrees of the same form. An example of the first would be a study comparing the inquiry method with the lecture method of instruction in teaching chemistry. An example of the second would be a study comparing the use of PowerPoint slides versus no PowerPoint slides in teaching statistics. An example of number three would be a study comparing the effects of different specified amounts of teacher enthusiasm on student attitudes toward mathematics. You know, the design of an experiment can take a variety of forms. Some of the designs we present in this section are better than others. However, why better? Good designs control many of these threats while poor designs control only a few. The quality of an experiment depends on how well the various threats to internal validity are controlled. Now, let's start with the poor designs. Poor designs that are weak do not have built-in controls for threats to internal validity. In addition to the independent variable, there are a number of other plausible explanations for any outcomes that occur. As a result, any researcher who uses one of these designs has difficulty assessing the effectiveness of the independent variable. In the one-shot case study design, a single group is exposed to a treatment or event and a dependent variable is subsequently observed or measured in order to assess the effect of the treatment. The symbol X represents exposure of the group to the treatment of interest, while O refers to observation of the dependent variable. The placement of the symbols from left to right indicates the order in time of X and O. As you can see, the treatment X comes before observation of the dependent variable O. The most obvious weakness of this design is its absence of any control. The researcher has no way of knowing if the results obtained at O are due to treatment of X. The, the design does not provide for any comparison. So, the researcher cannot compare the treatment. In the one group pre test post test design, a single group is measured or observed not only after being exposed to a treatment of some sort, but also before. This design is better than the one shot case study at, in a way that it is still weak. Nine uncontrolled for threats to internal validity exist that might also explain the results on the post-test. They are history, maturation, instrument decay, data collector characteristics, data collector bias, testing, statistical regression, attitude of subjects, and lastly, implementation. Any or all of these may influence the outcome of the study. The researcher would not know if any differences between the pretest and the post-test are due to the treatment or to one or more of these threats. To remedy this, a comparison group which does not receive the treatment could be added. Then, if a change in the attitude occurs between the pretest and the post-test, the researcher has reason to believe that it was caused by the treatment X. In the static group comparison design, 
two already existing or intact groups are used. These are sometimes referred to as static groups, hence the name for the design. This design is sometimes called a non-equivalent control group design in which the dash line indicates that the two groups being compared are already formed. That is, the subjects are not randomly assigned to the two groups. Here, symbolizes X as the experimental treatment. The blank space in the design indicates that the control group does not receive the experimental treatment. It may receive a different treatment or no treatment at all. The two O's are placed exactly vertical to each other, indicating that the observation or measurement of the two groups occur at the same time. Although this design provides better control over history, maturation, testing, and regression threats, it is more vulnerable not only to mortality and location, but also, more importantly, to the possibility of differential subject characteristics. The static group pretest post test design differs from the static group comparison design only in that a pretest is given to both groups. While this provides better control of the subject characteristics threat, the amount of gain often depends on initial performance. Next, let us now take a look at the true experimental designs. The essential ingredient of a true experimental design is that subjects are randomly assigned to treatment groups. As discussed earlier, random assignment is a powerful technique for controlling the subject characteristics threat to internal validity, in which it is a major consideration in business research. The randomized POSTAS only control group design involves two groups, both of which are formed by random assignment. One group receives the experimental treatment while the other does not, and then both groups are post-tests on dependent variable. As before, the symbol X represents exposure to the treatment and O refers to the measurement of the dependent variable. R represents the random assignment of individuals to groups. C now represents the control group. In this design, the control of certain threats is excellent through the use of random assignment the threats of subject characteristics, maturation, and statistical regression are well controlled for because none of the subjects in the study are measured twice. Testing is not a possible threat. This is perhaps the best of all designs to use in an experimental study provided there are at least 40 subjects in each group. The randomized pretest post-test control group design differs from the randomized post-test only control group design solely in the use of a pretest. Two groups of subjects are used, with both groups being measured or observed twice. The first measurement serves as the pretest, the second as the post-test. Random assignment is used to form the groups. The measurements or observations are then collected at the same time for both groups. The use of the pretest raises the possibility of a pretest treatment interaction threat since it may alert the members of the experimental group, thereby causing them to do better or more poorly on the post test than the members of the control group. A trade-off is that it provides a researcher with a means of checking whether the two groups are really similar, that is, whether 
when the assignment actually succeeded in making the groups equivalent. This is particularly desirable if the number in each group is small. If the pretest shows that the groups are not equivalent, the researcher can seek to make them so by using one of the matching designs we will discuss shortly. A pretest is also necessary if the amount of change over time is to be assessed. The randomized Solomon for group design is an attempt to eliminate the possible effect of a pretest. It involves random assignment of subjects to four groups, with two of the groups being pretest and the other two not. One of the pretest groups and one of the unpretest group is exposed to the experimental treatment. All four groups are then post test. The re randomized Solomon four group design combines the pretest post test control group and post-test only control group designs. The first two groups represent the pre-test post-test control group design, while the last two groups represent the post-test only control group design. The randomized Solomon 4 group design provides the best control of threats to internal validity that we have discussed. A weakness, however, is that it requires a large sample because subjects must be assigned to four groups. Furthermore, conducting a study involving four groups at the same time requires a considerable amount of energy and effort on the part of the researcher. In an attempt to increase the likelihood that the groups of subjects in an experiment will be equivalent, pairs of individuals may be matched on certain variables. The choice of variables on which to match is based on previous research, theory, or the experience of the researcher. The members of each matched pair are then assigned to the experimental and control groups at random. This adaptation can be made to both the post-test only control group design and the pre-test post-test control group design, although the latter is more common. The symbol M subscript R refers to the fact that the members of each matched pair are randomly assigned to the experimental and control groups. Although a pretest of the dependent variable is commonly used to provide scores on which to match a measurement of any variable that shows a substantial relationship to the dependent variable is appropriate. Matching may be done in either or both of two ways. We have the mechanically or statistically, in which both require a score for each subject on each variable on which subjects are to be matched. There are lots of other true experimental design and I think they require lots of time and must be discussed by someone who is knowledgeable with the topic. For now, let us proceed to the next topic which is the correlational research. A correlational research is an example of what is sometimes called as associational research. In associational research, the relationships among two or more variables are studied without any attempt to influence them. A comparison between two entities is invariable. Correlation research is conducted to establish a relationship between two closely knit entities and how one impacts the other and what are the changes that are eventually observed. This research method is carried out to give value to naturally occurring relationships and a minimum of two different groups are required to conduct this quantitative research method successfully. Without assuming various aspects, a relationship between two groups or entities must be established. 
Researchers use this quantitative research design to correlate two or more variables using mathematical analysis methods, patterns, relationships, and trends between variables are concluded as they exist in their original setup. The impact of one of these variables on the other is observed along with how it changes the relationship between the two variables. Researchers tend to manipulate one of the variables to attain the desired results. There are two major purposes of correlational research. But now, let us take a look at the different objectives we have for this subtopic. Again, there are two major purposes of a correlational research. First is the explanatory studies. A major purpose of correlational research is to clarify our understanding of important phenomena by identifying relationships among variables. Particularly in developmental psychology, where experimental studies are especially difficult to design, much has been learned by analyzing relationships among second, several variables. Second, we have the prediction studies. A second purpose of correlational research is prediction. If a relationship of sufficient magnitude exists between two variables, it becomes possible to predict a score on one variable if the score on the other variable is known. The variable that is used to make the prediction is called the predictor variable. The variable about which the prediction is made is called the criterion variable. Take this as an example. Researchers have found that high school grades are highly related to college grades. Hence, high school grades can be used to predict college grades. We would predict that a person with a high GPA in high school would be likely to have a high GPA in college. Hence, in the above example, high school grades would be the predictor variable. So on the other hand, college grades would be the criterion variable. Now, let us learn the different steps involved in a correlational research. They are 1. You have the problem selection. 2. Sample. 3. Instruments. 4. Design and procedures. 5. Data collection. And last, we have data analysis and interpretation. Let's start with the problem selection. The variables to be included in a correlational study should be based on a sound rationale growing out of experience or theory. The researcher should have some reason for thinking certain variables may be related. As always, clarity in defining variables will avoid many problems later on. In general, three major types of problems are the focus of correlational studies and they are number one is variable x related to variable y how well does variable p predict variable c what are the relationships among a large number of variables and what predictions can be made that are based on them Second, we do sampling. The sample for a correlational study, as in any type of study, should be selected carefully and, if possible, randomly. The first step in selecting a sample, of course, is to identify an appropriate population, one that is meaningful and from which data on each of the variables of interest can be 
collected. The minimum acceptable sample size for a correlational study is considered by most researchers to be no less than 30. Data obtained from a sample smaller than 30 may give an inaccurate estimate of the degree of relationship. Samples larger than 30 are much more likely to provide meaningful results. The basic design used in a correlational study is quite straightforward. As you can see, two or more scores are obtained from each individual in a sample. One score for each variable of interest. The pairs of scores are then correlated and the resulting correlation coefficient indicates the degree of relationship between the variables. We have if the data collection in an explanatory study, all the data on both variables will usually be collected within a fairly short time. Often, the instruments used are administered in a single session or in two sessions, one immediately after the other. And remember, when we collect already the data, we should always protect the privacy of our respondents. Lastly, we have data analysis and interpretation. As we have mentioned previously, when variables are correlated, a correlation coefficient is produced. This coefficient will be a decimal somewhere between 0 0.00 and plus 1 or negative 1. The closer the coefficient to plus 1 or negative 1, the stronger the relationship. If the sign is positive, the relationship is positive, indicating that high scores on one variable tend to go with high scores on the other variable. If the design is negative, the relationship is negative, indicating that high scores on one variable tend to go with low scores on the other variable. Coefficients that are at or near 0, 0.00 indicate that no relationship exists between the variables involved. Now, let's turn to the last subtopic which is survey research. Let us first design what is survey. Let's take a look at these objectives that we have for this subtopic. Okay, a survey is a research method used for collecting data from a predefined group of respondents to gain information and insights into various topics of interest. They can have multiple purposes and researchers can conduct it in many ways depending on the methodology chosen and the study's goal. You know, researchers are often interested in the opinions of a large group of people about a particular topic or issue. They ask a number of questions, all related to the issue, to find answers. But, why are surveys conducted? The major purpose of surveys is to describe the characteristics of a population. In essence, what researchers want to find out is how the members of a population distribute themselves on one or more variables. As in other types of research, of course, the population as a whole is rarely studied. Instead, a carefully selected sample of respondents is surveyed and a description of the population is in inferred from what is found about the sample. There are two types of surveys. One is cross-sectional and the other is longitudinal surveys. Cross-sectional surveys or observational surveys conducted in situations 
where the researcher intends to collect data from a sample of the target population at a given point in time. Researchers can evaluate various variables at a particular time. Data gathered using this type of survey is from people who depict similarity in all variables except the variables which are considered for research. Throughout the survey, this one variable will stay constant. By the way, um, I would like you to know that when an entire population is surveyed, it is called as census. Longitudinal surveys are also observational surveys, but unlike cross-sectional surveys, this type of surveys are conducted across various time durations to observe a change in respondent behavior and thought processes. This time can be days, months, years, or even decades. Three longitudinal designs are commonly employed in survey research. We have the trend studies, cohort studies, and panel study. To understand more, look at the illustration shown in the screen. Let's move forward. We now look at the different modes of data collection. We have first, direct administration to do, second, web-based surveys, third, mail survey, fourth, telephone survey, and last, we have the personal interview. In the direct administration to a group, this method is used whenever a researcher has access to all or most of the respondents of a particular group in one place. The instrument is administered to all members of the group at the same time and usually in the same place. Web-based surveys, or we call as online surveys, have technological advances. Technological advances have made these surveys on the internet quite common. Increasingly, researchers and students are turning to email or web-based surveys. It is much easier, especially when you can reach your target population easily. Mail surveys. When the data in a survey are collected by mail, the questionnaire is sent to each individual in the sample with a request that it could be completed and then returned by a given date. Um, the advantages of this approach are that it is relatively inexpensive and it can be accomplished by the researcher alone. It also allows the researcher to have access to samples that might be hard to reach in person or by telephone and it permits the respondents to take sufficient time to give thoughtful answers to the questions asked. The disadvantage of mail surveys are that there is less opportunity to encourage the cooperation of the respondents or to provide assistance in answering their questions or clarifying instructions and so on. As a result, mail surveys have a tendency to produce low response rates. Mail surveys also do not lend themselves well to obtain information from certain types of sample. In a telephone survey, the researcher or his or her assistant um, asks questions of the respondents over the telephone. There are advantages of telephone surveys um, and they are Telephone surveys are cheaper than personal interviews and can be conducted fairly and quickly and lend themselves easily to standardized questioning procedures. They also allow the researcher to assist the respondents, permit a greater amount of follow-up, and provide better coverage in certain areas where personal interviewers often are reluctant to go.
The disadvantages of telephone surveys are that access to some samples is not possible. Telephone interviews also prevent visual observation of respondents and are somewhat less effective in obtaining information about sensitive issues or personal questions. Personal interviews in which the researcher or his trained assistant conducts a face-to-face -face interview with the respondent. As a result, this method has many advantages. It is probably the most effective survey method for enlisting the cooperation of the respondents. Rapport can be established, questions can be clarified, unclear or incomplete answers can be followed up, and so on. Face-to-face -face interviewing also places less of a burden on the reading and writing skills of the respondents and, when necessary, permits spending more time with respondents. The biggest disadvantage of face-to-face -face interviews is that they are more costly than direct mail or telephone surveys. They also require a trained staff or interviewees with all that implies in terms of training costs and time. The total data collection time required is also likely to be um, quite a bit longer than in any of the other three methods. To summarize, the following are the disadvantages and the advantages of each modes of data collection. Now, the nature of the questions and the way they are asked are extremely important in survey research. Poorly worded questions can doom a survey to failure. Hence, they must be clearly written in a manner that is easily understandable by the respondents. There are actually two types of questions. We have the close-ended and the open-ended. Close-ended questions are easy to use, score, and code for analysis on a computer because all subjects respond to the same options. Standardized data are provided. They are somewhat more difficult to write than open-ended questions. However, they also pose the possibility that an individual's true response is not present among the options given. For this reason, the researcher usually should provide an other choice for each item. Where the subject can write in a response that the researcher may not have anticipated. Some examples of close-ended questions are the following. Open-ended questions allow for more individualized responses, but they are sometimes difficult to interpret. They are also often hard to score since so many different kinds of responses are received. Furthermore, respondents sometimes do not like them. Some examples of open-ended questions are as follows. Generally, therefore, close-ended or short-answered questions are preferable, although sometimes researchers find it um, useful to combine both formats in a single question. The following shows the difference between the two. Have you ever encountered a non-response in your survey? In almost all surveys, some members of the sample will not respond. This is referred to as non-response. It may be due to a number of reasons such as lack of interest in the topic being surveyed, forgetfulness, unwillingness to be surveyed, and so on. 
but it is a major problem that has been increasing in recent years as more and more people seem to be unwilling to participate in surveys. Why is non-response a problem? The chief reason is that those who do not respond will very likely differ from the respondents and answers to the surveyed questions. Should this be the case, any conclusions drawn on the basis of the respondents' replies will be misleading and not a true indication of the views of the population from which the sample was drawn. Okay, now we already have learned the different types of quantitative research. To wrap things up, let's take a look at the advantages of a quantitative research. Actually, there are many advantages of quantitative research. Some of the major advantages of why researchers use this method in market research are Number one, collect reliable and accurate data. As data is collected, analyzed, and presented in numbers, the results obtained will be extremely reliable because numbers do not lie. Second, quick data collection. Quantitative research is carried out with a group of respondents who represent a population. A survey or any other quantitative research method is applied to these respondents and the involvement of statistics, conducting and analyzing results is quite straightforward and less time-consuming. Third, we have wider scope of data analysis. Due to the statistics, this research method provides a wide scope of data collection. And lastly, eliminate bias. This research method offers no scope for personal comments or biasing of results. The results achieved are numerical and are thus fair in most cases. Before we end, let's take a look at the two main sampling methods for quantitative research. We have the probability and non-probability sampling. There are four main types of probability sampling, and they are simple random sampling, stratified random sampling, cluster sampling, and systematic sampling. On the other hand, we also have the non-probability sampling, which we have convenient sampling, consecutive sampling, quota sampling, and snowball sampling. Let us learn what are the different um, types of this sampling. In probability sampling, we have simple random sampling. As the name indicates, simple random sampling is nothing but a random selection of elements for a sample. This sampling technique is implemented for the target population is considerably large. Stratified random sampling um, in the stratified random sampling method, a large population is divided into groups or which we call as the strata. And members of a sample are chosen randomly from this strata. The various segregated strata should ideally not overlap one another. In cluster sampling, a cluster sampling is a probability sampling method using which the main segment is divided into clusters, usually using geographic and demographic segmentation parameters. And last, systematic sampling is a technique where the starting point of the sample is chosen randomly and all the other elements are chosen using a fixed interval. This interval is calculated by dividing the population size by the, by the target sample size. There are also four non-probability sampling models and we have first the convenience sampling. 
Here, elements of a sample are chosen only due to one prime reason. Their proximity to the researcher. These samples are quick and easy to implement as there is no other parameter of selection involved. Consecutive sampling is quite similar to convenient sampling, except for the fact that researchers can choose a single element or a group of samples and conduct research consecutively over a significant period and then perform the same process with other samples. Using quota sampling, researchers can select elements using their knowledge of target traits and personalities to form a strata. Members of various strata can then be chosen to be a part of the sample as per the research understanding. And we have the snowball sampling. It is conducted with target audience in which are difficult to contact and get information. It is popular in cases where the target audience for research is rare to put together. This would be the end of my slide. Thank you for listening.